May 6th, 1975, Pocatello, Idaho. After leaving her school on her lunch break, 12-year-old Lynette Culver vanishes without a trace and is subsequently reported missing. Nearly 14 years later, prior to his execution, serial killer Ted Bundy confesses to being responsible for Lynette's murder. While many people believe Bundy's confession, Lynette's body is never found, and in the years following her disappearance, four other girls from Pocatello wind up becoming the victims of unsolved murders. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to our latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warner and today we'll be exploring a missing persons case involving a preteen girl, the 1975 disappearance of 12-year-old Lynette Culver. This case was originally requested to me last year by a listener named Kimberly, but there's a reason I've decided to cover it right now. Lynette's story wound up receiving nationwide coverage when one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy, confessed to being responsible for her murder only days before his execution in January of 1989. His confession seemed to be a pretty believable one, but since Lynette's body has never been found, her case is not officially considered to be closed. Now, as I'm sure you're well aware, even though he's been dead for three decades, Ted Bundy has received a lot of attention these past few years, as a documentary series about him was released on Netflix, as well as a movie titled Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, starring Zac Efron. Yet that still doesn't seem to be enough, as we've got no less than two more fictionalized movies about Bundy scheduled to be released within the next year, and needless to say, Ted Bundy fatigue has really started to set in. From the recent backlash I've seen about this news online, the message seems to be clear. True crime media should be putting more focus on Ted Bundy's victims rather than Bundy himself, so that's exactly what I'm going to do on today's episode about Lynette Culver. Let's face it, there are a lot of young females that went missing during the 1970s who are believed to be potential Bundy victims and have still not been found to this day, so they deserve the spotlight. What adds a further complication to Lynette Culver's story is that no less than four other pre-teen or teen girls from her hometown of Pocatello would go missing and be found murdered during an eight-year window following her disappearance. Since Ted Bundy was locked up before these other crimes took place, he could not have been the responsible party, so who was? While those cases might not actually be connected to Lynette's disappearance, none of them have been solved, so we're going to spend some time exploring them on this episode. Anyway, before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast, which is currently available for download on several platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it, and please leave us a rating or review on any of those sites to help spread the word. The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so if you would like to learn how to support the show, please visit our page at patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold. For as little as $1 a month, you can garner access to exclusive rewards, which may include stickers and thank you cards, early accessed episodes, and bonus content. So with all that out of the way, let us now start off by exploring the disappearance of Lynette Culver. Our story begins in 1975 in Pocatello, Idaho, a town located in Bannock County, which had a population of around 46,000 at that time. Our central figure is 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver, who currently lives with her parents, Alan Carroll Culver, as well as her older brother and sister. Lynette was originally born in Renton, Washington, before her family moved to Pocatello when she was five years old, and she is currently a seventh grade student at Alameda Junior High School. At around noon on May the 6th, Lynette was seen leaving the school for her lunch break, but she never returned and did not come home that day. She was eventually reported missing to the Pocatello Police Department, who were initially inclined to believe that she ran away, but her family had a hard time believing this. Lynette's case would be assigned to Detective Al Kuda, who had a vested interest in finding her since the Culver family were his next door neighbors. The earliest reporting stated, that after Lynette left Alameda Junior High School, she had been seen boarding a bus near Hawthorne Junior High School, located just over a mile away. The sightings were provided by the bus driver and some of Lynette's friends, and were initially deemed to be credible, especially since the bus had been headed in the direction of the Fort Hall Reservation, a Native American reservation located outside Pocatello, as additional eyewitnesses would report seeing her there. By the time Lynette's disappearance reached its two-year anniversary, the Idaho State Journal newspaper published an article about the case featuring an interview with Detective Kuda, who had since retired. He stated, quote, in my opinion, there are at least three people who know what happened to Lynette Culver, end quote. Kuda claimed that he spoke to one girl who told him, quote, she is happy where she is, but would not answer when he asked her if Lynette was dead or alive. Kuda also implied that there were people who were afraid to say anything and that the answers to Lynette's disappearance could be found at the Fort Hall Reservation. Over the years, there would be a number of reported sightings of Lynette in other sections of the United States, and her father would often travel to these locations to personally check into them, but none of the leads ever panned out. Lynette's case faded from the spotlight for over a decade until she was unexpectedly linked to one of the most notorious serial killers of all time, Ted 
Bundy. As I'm sure you probably know, after being convicted of the murders of three victims, Margaret Bowman, Lisa Levy, and Kimberly Leach, Bundy received three separate death sentences before he was executed in the electric chair at Florida State Prison on January the 24th, 1989. But in the months prior to his death, Bundy had decided to confess his involvement in no less than 30 unsolved cases involving the murder or disappearance of young females, which took place in seven different states throughout the 1970s. No one knows for certain how many murders Bundy was actually responsible for, and he would deliberately withhold certain details during his confessions in hopes that this might help delay his execution. On January the 22nd, two days before his execution went through, Bundy spoke to Russ Renault, an investigator with the Idaho Attorney General's office, and confessed to a pair of additional murders which took place in that state, though he said he did not know either of the victims' names. The first one supposedly took place in September of 1974, where Bundy claimed he picked up a young female hitchhiker on a highway on the outskirts of Boise, before he proceeded to strangle her to death and dump her body. Since the victim's remains were never found, and this crime could not be linked to any cold cases from the area involving missing women, Bundy's story was never corroborated. However, Bundy's second confession involved him murdering a young girl in Pocatello in May of 1975, three months before he was initially arrested. At the time, he had been living in Salt Lake City, Utah, but decided to make a 165-mile drive to Pocatello for what he described as the quote-unquote madness, aka the urge to find a victim to murder. Bundy said that he specifically chose Pocatello as his destination because he could drive his Volkswagen bug there and make it back home without ever having to stop for gas and leave a potential trail of evidence. When he arrived, he said he went to the girl's dormitory at Idaho State University to search for a potential victim, but he was forced to leave when security noticed him. As a result, Bundy decided to rent a room at the Holiday Inn near the freeway to stay overnight in Pocatello. The following day at around noon, Bundy drove to Alameda Junior High School, where he spotted a young girl and managed to convince her to enter his vehicle. He then said he proceeded to murder the victim and rape her dead body, and during a second interview with another investigator, Bundy confirmed that he had taken the girl to his room at the Holiday Inn and drowned her in the bathtub. Since Bundy had deliberately selected a room located near the rear of the hotel, he managed to move the victim's body into his trunk without being seen. He then drove a couple miles north of Pocatello and dumped the body into a stream which he described as about 100 yards wide, and it seemed very likely that this was the Snake River. Well, Bundy's description of this girl seemed to match Lynette Culver, and he also provided details about a conversation they had together in his car, stating, quote, She made a comment that sounded like she had other friends or relatives in Seattle. The reason I remember that is because I've been in Seattle. Made a comment indicating that she either lived with her grandmother or that her grandmother lived with her family. Another comment indicating that perhaps they were thinking of moving to another house indications that she had some trouble with truancies at school, and finally, that I encountered her at a time when she was leaving the school grounds to meet someone at lunchtime, end quote. Well, when Lynette's family was informed about Bundy's confession, they were able to corroborate a number of these details which he had mentioned about her personal life, such as her grandmother having lived with them. While the Culvers did not believe that Lynette had issues with truancy, school records showed that Lynette had numerous absences that year, which were never reported to her parents. Investigators were unable to find any conclusive evidence which proved that Bundy had traveled to Pocatello in May of 1975, as the records for the Holiday Inn where he supposedly stayed only dated back to 1983. And if Bundy was telling the truth about having disposed of Lynette's body in the Snake River, there was not much hope about being able to recover her remains after so many years. But after reviewing all the original media coverage of Lynette's disappearance, investigators were certain that Bundy could not have obtained the details he revealed about her personal life from there. At the time, the Pocatello Police Department said they were quote-unquote 99% certain that Bundy's confession was probably genuine, and the Culver family agreed that he probably did kill her. However, in August of 2018, Pocatello Police Captain James McCoy publicly confirmed that they were not 100% certain Bundy was responsible for Lynette's disappearance and that the case was never officially closed. He stated, quote, We don't have a body, and Culver is still a missing person. During the initial investigation, there were multiple individuals who came forward with conflicting information. And until we can find her remains, or there is absolutely nothing else we can do, we are going to continue to look into this. End quote. McCoy mentioned that the department was exploring potential commonalities between Lynette's case and a number of other unsolved murders which took place in Pocatello during an eight-year period following her disappearance. I will be going into more detail about these other cases later on in this episode, but the victims' ages ranged from between 12 to 15 years old, and all but one of them had been students at Alameda Junior High School. The issue was that the first of these murders took place on July the 22nd, 1978, and since Ted Bundy was incarcerated from February of that year until his execution in 1989, he could not have been responsible for any of the other crimes. In 2019, around the time when Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile, the movie about Bundy's life, was released on Netflix, it was announced that a GoFundMe campaign had been launched to raise money to build a Lynette Culver Memorial Bench in Pocatello. After the funds were raised, the memorial was unveiled at a dedication ceremony at the Ross Park Aquatic Complex on July the 31st of that year, which would have been Lynette's 57th birthday. The stone bench had Lynette's likeness engraved on it, as well as her birth date, the date of her disappearance, and some swirls and patterns she had once drawn on her jacket. It also contained this message, quote, 
Rest peacefully, sweet child. Wherever you are, you will be in our minds and hearts forever. Lynette's sister, Nancy Albano, spoke about her life at the ceremony and said that one of her most treasured memories occurred in April of 1975, only a few weeks before Lynette went missing. They have both completed a 20-mile walk to benefit the March of Dimes and received coupons for free Big Macs at McDonald's for the participation. While Nancy was completely exhausted, Lynette still had enough energy that she immediately climbed onto her bike and headed to McDonald's to redeem the coupons. Nancy made a point not to mention Ted Bundy's name during her speech, only stating that a man had once confessed to Lynette's murder before he was executed. When asked about the possibility of Bundy being the perpetrator, Nancy stated, quote, There's always a chance he was just familiar with her disappearance. It would be wonderful if they found something else and were able to recover her. As of right now, we believe Ted Bundy did it. End quote. But as far as the Pocatello PD is concerned, Lynette Culver's disappearance is still an open investigation, and she continues to remain a missing person. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So obviously, this podcast episode is not going to waste any time delving into Ted Bundy's background because that's very well trodden ground. All I really need to say is that he was an evil, murderous douchebag and leave it at that. But regardless of whether or not Lynette Culver was a Bundy victim, I want this episode to function as a memorial for her. I previously mentioned that Lynette was originally born in Renton, Washington, which is an inner ring suburb of Seattle, and this is one of those tragic stories in which her parents decided to move to a smaller town because they thought Pocatello would be a safer place to raise their children. There was certainly no reason to believe she might fall prey to one of the worst serial killers of all time who lived over two hours away. If you go on YouTube, you'll find a 45-minute documentary about Lynette's life assembled together by a user named Captain Borax, which features a tour of a lot of the key locations in Pocatello, as well as interviews with Lynette's surviving family members. You can also find a segment about Bundy from the TV show Hard Copy, which was filmed after his execution and explores his confession to Lynette's murder. The recording of Bundy's confession was played for Lynette's family for the first time, though her mother Carol left the room as she refused to listen to it and said she never would. The stress of the whole situation had caused Carol's hair to turn white a short time after Lynette disappeared, but in an ironic turn of events, Bundy's execution just happened to take place on Carol's birthday. Obviously, the Culver family would love to recover Lynette's remains and give her a proper burial, but they seem to have come to terms with the fact that she was likely a Bundy victim and the right person ultimately faced justice for this crime. Of course, Bundy confessed to a lot of murders prior to his execution, but much like Lynette, some of the other victims he mentioned are still missing and have never been found, so it could not be officially confirmed if he actually killed them. I'll be talking a bit more about these other victims near the end of this episode, but the thing with convicted serial killers is that once they've reached the point where they have nothing left to lose, they will do whatever they can to manipulate people, whether it be confessing to murders they did not commit, or deliberately remaining silent about murders they were not connected to. Bundy's confessions were most definitely not born out of a need to tell the truth, but rather a desperate attempt to buy himself more time to postpone his execution. Indeed, while Bundy's confession to Lynette's murder does sound convincing on the surface, let's not forget that he also confessed to the murder of a female hitchhiker in Idaho in 1974, but that crime has never been definitively proven or linked to any missing victims, so we have no idea if his story is even true. But that doesn't change the fact that Bundy provided specific details about Lynette, which he probably could not have known unless he personally interacted with her. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have any reason to doubt the narrative that Bundy killed her, but I have to acknowledge that the Pocatello Police Department has stated in recent years they are not 100% convinced this is what happened, which is why they've kept the investigation open. I'll get back to Lynette's case in a little while, but I think the primary issue is that four other girls from Pocatello wound up being murdered during the eight years following Lynette's disappearance, and like Lynette, three of the other victims were students at Alameda Junior High School. While there's no hard evidence to suggest that any of these cases are connected, it's clear that the Pocatello PD wants to keep all their options open. While Pocatello is by no means a small town, its population was around 46,000 during this time period, and it does seem unusual that so many unsolved murders involving pre-teen or teen girls would take place there within one eight-year window. This whole situation is reminiscent of the episode I released last year about the Lewis Clark Valley murders, which took place during the late 1970s and early 1980s on the other side of the state in the town of Lewiston, Idaho, right next to the Washington state line. Of course, there's no indication that these two stories are connected, and in the Lewis Clark Valley murders case, there is a person of interest who is suspected of being responsible for all the crimes. It also must be stated that at no point have the authorities ever confirmed that they believe a serial killer might be responsible for all the murders which took place in Pocatello, so I'm definitely not trying to suggest all these victims fell prey to the same person. But since all the cases are still unsolved, let's explore each of them one by one. On July the 22nd, 1978, 12-year-old Tina Anderson and 15-year-old Patricia Campbell attended a Pioneer Day celebration at Alameda Park. The story goes that they were hanging around friends and family members at the swing set before they left to buy some corn dogs, but they never returned, and both girls were eventually reported missing. 
Patricia's sister would say she had last seen Patricia and Tina in the park with a young man wearing a blue hooded sweatshirt and a large ring. The two girls would remain missing persons until October of 1981, when hunters stumbled across some human remains in a remote gorge located about 60 miles southeast of Pocatello in the Trail Hollow area of neighboring Oneida County. The remains appeared to belong to a pair of female victims, and one of them was a skull with a small hole on the right side, which was consistent with a small caliber bullet. Several 22 caliber casings were also recovered from the scene during an excavation. Dental records were used to identify the skull as belonging to Tina, and while it was assumed that the other set of remains belonged to Patricia, her skull was not found, so a positive identification would not be made until DNA testing was performed on these remains in March of 2007. Months before the testing, the case had been rejuvenated when an Idaho prison investigator provided undisclosed information about possible suspects to the Anita County Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office decided to perform a new excavation at the spot where the remains had been found, and two new key pieces of evidence were unearthed which they hoped might link them to a suspect. Investigators did not initially disclose what these pieces of evidence were, though they later revealed that one of them was a rock which appeared to have fingerprints on it. During this time period, Oneida County Sheriff Jeff Samrad told the media he believed they were close to making an arrest and that a grand jury would be convened by the end of the summer of 2007, but this never came to fruition. In March of 2016, Sheriff Semrat publicly announced that investigators were confident they had finally solved the case, though he would not release any further details. Over the course of the next year, the case would be submitted to the Oneida County District Attorney, but in May of 2017, it was announced that the case was being handed back to the Sheriff's Office for further investigation. So from what I gathered, it appears that law enforcement has a pretty good idea who committed these murders and believe that multiple people were involved, but prosecutors do not think the evidence is strong enough to pile charges. There's an additional complication in this case, but first, I'm going to mention the two other unsolved murders from Pocatello. In 1981, 14-year-old Linda Smith was a student at Franklin Junior High School, making her the only one of these victims who did not attend Alameda Junior High. On this particular night, Linda was babysitting her 9-year-old brother Ben, who fell asleep in a recliner watching TV. At around 2 a.m. on June the 14th, Ben woke up to see a male intruder abducting his sister from their home. When Ben ran out to confront this man, he was pushed to the ground before the abductor forced Linda into a van with flames painted on the side and fled the scene. Since his own residence did not have a phone, Ben ran to a neighbor's house to call for help, and he described the perpetrator as being a man in his 30s with dirty blonde hair. Now, you've heard me mention many times on this podcast that police did not always do the greatest job of handling missing persons cases involving teenagers during the 1970s and early 1980s, as they were often content to write them off as runaways. But this might be the absolute worst example of this, as the Pocatello Police Department completely disbelieved Ben's story about witnessing Linda's abduction. Since their family was being raised by a single mother on welfare, police figured that Linda decided to run away on her own. Due to the stress of the whole situation, Ben had to keep retelling parts of his story because he forgot to share certain details, but investigators took this as a sign that he was lying, and accused Ben of fabricating the entire incident in order to cover for his sister. No, seriously. They did not attempt to preserve evidence or take fingerprints from the crime scene, and even after some of Linda's clothing was found scattered in a ditch near Interstate 15 one week later, the police still stuck to the runaway theory. However, everything changed in May of 1982, when Linda's skull was found by some children playing in a ravine on the east side of Pocatello, though her exact cause of death was never determined. Needless to say, Ben grew up struggling with a lot of guilt and anxiety over not having prevented his sister's abduction, and even spent some time in a mental health facility. In June of 2006, the Pocatello PD acknowledged their mistakes in the original investigation and decided to reopen the case. According to Ben and one of his other sisters, about a year before Linda was abducted, a man had written a threatening letter to the family from jail after they turned him in for a crime. At one point, Ben picked this man out of a photo lineup and identified him as the intruder, but even though the family said they turned this threatening letter over to the police, they apparently no longer have it. This person had served time in prison and was reportedly living in the Boise area at the time Linda's case was reopened, but the investigation has not gone anywhere. The final unsolved murder which took place in Pocatello occurred during the early morning hours of June the 4th, 1983, and involved 14-year-old Cindy Bringhurst, who was babysitting the two-year-old child of a single mother at their apartment. This woman worked at the Oasis bar and had her purse and key stolen in the middle of her shift, so she called the apartment and spoke to Cindy at around 11.45 p.m. to confirm that everything was okay. But by the time the woman returned home two hours later, Cindy had gone missing. The child Cindy had been babysitting was still sleeping in their crib and was left unharmed, but even though there was no sign of any struggle and nothing had been stolen, the apartment's door was unlocked and the television was left on. One week later, a man who was suspected of stealing the woman's purse was identified, but even though his vehicle was searched and several items were collected, the purse itself could not be found, so he was never charged with anything. On July the 7th, a fisherman discovered Cindy's decomposed body partially submerged in a stream in the West Fork of Mink Creek, about 20 miles southwest of Pocatello. She was identified through her dental records, though her exact cause of death has never been released publicly, and it could not be determined if Cindy was killed at the location or if she was killed elsewhere before her body was dumped there. 
In this particular case, it's tough to determine whether the victim was deliberately targeted or if she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. While it was never conclusively proven if the theft of the woman's purse from the bar was connected to Cindy's murder, I think it would be one hell of a coincidence if it wasn't. It's possible the responsible party only stole the purse with the intention of using the keys to rob this woman's apartment because they knew she would be at work at that time. But when they arrived, they did not expect Cindy to be there and wound up abducting and murdering her in order to cover up their attempted burglary. However, it's also possible they knew Cindy would be there alone babysitting and decided to steal the keys for the specific purpose of entering the apartment and taking advantage of the situation. Now, I'll state right up front that my personal impression is that the disappearance of Lynette Culver, the murders of Tina Anderson and Patricia Campbell, as well as the abductions of Linda Smith and Cindy Bringhurst, are not connected, and each of these crimes were likely committed by different perpetrators. However, there is one very strange complication. On October the 26th, 1986, a partial skull without its mandible was discovered in Two Mile Canyon in Oneida County, and it was believed to have belonged to a young female who had been repeatedly struck on the side of the head with a blunt object. The skull has been examined by multiple experts, and there seem to be differing opinions about what the victim may have looked like, as separate people believe she may have been African-American, biracial, or white. And while she was initially thought to be between 12 to 16 years old, it's also possible she could have been in her early 20s. Since she could not be identified, the victim has become known as the Oneida County Jane Doe. For years, the partial skull inexplicably went missing after it was shipped to a lab to be processed for DNA, but it was announced in 2018 that the skull had been recovered and was sent to the FBI for analysis. What's particularly interesting is that the skull was found only about 500 to 600 yards from the gorge where the remains of Tina Anderson and Patricia Campbell had been discovered. On the same day those two girls went missing, Patricia's father had been searching for them on the streets surrounding Alameda Park, and he wound up crossing paths with a Hispanic man who said he was also looking for his missing teenage daughter. Mr. Campbell never got this man's name or saw him again, but there were no missing persons reports filed for an Hispanic girl during this time period. However, it's been theorized that this man could have been a migrant worker and may not have reported his daughter missing due to potential issues with his family's immigration status. It's believed that the skull was around five or six years old at the time it was found, so this opens up the question. Could the Oneida County Jane Doe have gone missing from Alameda Park at the same time as Tina and Patricia before all three of them were murdered and had their bodies dumped at this remote location? Since the location was about 60 miles outside Pocatello, we still don't know if the Jane Doe actually lived there, but if the person who killed her was not responsible for the murders of Tina and Patricia, the odds of two separate killers dumping their victims at this same remote location seem pretty astronomical. Were Tina, Patricia, and the Jane Doe all murdered at the exact same time? Or could the same perpetrator have murdered the Jane Doe at a later time and decided to dump her remains at the spot where they had dumped the other two girls? Since all they found was a partial skull, I guess the alternate explanation is that the victim could have been murdered and dumped at another location before an animal picked up the skull and carried it to Two Mile Canyon. But still, what are the odds that it would wind up in such close proximity to the remains of two other unrelated murder victims? Since the race of the Oneida County Jane Doe has never been conclusively determined, I've seen online sleuths suggest the possibility that the partial skull could have belonged to Lynette Culver, and as far as I can tell, she has never been officially excluded. I guess this would all depend on whether you believe Ted Bundy killed Lynette, because he would have been incarcerated by the time Tina and Patricia were murdered, and once again, it seems like one hell of a coincidence that a completely different killer would dump two victims in the same remote location where Bundy had disposed of a victim three years earlier. Like I mentioned earlier, it seems like law enforcement has a pretty good idea of who Tina and Patricia's killers are, but I just have no idea how the Oneida County Jane Doe fits into this whole situation. Even so, while it is certainly unusual that Pocatello has all these different cold cases involving young girls, I really don't see any indication they're connected. I certainly hope that the murderers of Tina Anderson, Patricia Campbell, Linda Smith, and Cindy Bringhurst are all brought to justice someday, but I see no indication that the perpetrators of any of these crimes were responsible for what happened to Lynette Culver. So does this mean Lynette was a victim of Ted Bundy? Well, obviously, the strongest piece of evidence to support this is the fact that Bundy provided exclusive details about Lynette's personal life during his confession. Yes, Bundy could have learned details about the case from the newspapers and fabricated a false confession, but I don't know how he could have learned things like Lynette's family relocating to another house or her grandmother having lived with them. I've read quite a few of the newspaper articles from when Lynette originally went missing, and I never saw any of these personal details published, so you get the impression that she had to have spoken with Bundy at some point. But there is a big contradiction which plants a few seeds of doubt. The original reporting about Lynette's disappearance states that she had been seen boarding a bus outside a different junior high school located just over a mile away from her school, and multiple witnesses, including Lynette's friends, seemed to corroborate this. However, Bundy's story was that he picked up Lynette in his car immediately after she exited Alameda Junior High School. Remember, when Captain McCoy of the Pocatello PD expressed his reasons why this case was still open, he stated, quote, During the initial investigation, there were multiple individuals who came forward with conflicting information. In addition, there were also sightings of Lynette at the Fort Hall Reservation outside of town after she left the school, which was the destination this bus would have been headed. 
Judging from his interviews during that time period, the lead detective, Al Kuda, seemed convinced that the reservation held the answers to Lynette's disappearance. This may have had something to do with the fact that back in April of 1962, a 16-year-old Pocatello girl named Vicky Jo Quinn was brutally murdered after being stabbed 25 times, and her body was found buried on the Fort Hall reservation. While a pair of suspects were eventually charged for that crime, Kuda wondered if perhaps history might have repeated itself. Kuda said that he believed at least three people knew the truth about what happened to Lynette, and I'm pretty certain he wasn't referring to Ted Bundy. I'd be really curious to know who these three people were, and what Kuda believed actually happened, but he passed away only about a year after making these comments. Well, one source I used to put together this episode were a series of books about Ted Bundy, written by true crime author Kevin Sullivan, and he seems to believe that the sightings of Lynette on the bus and at the reservation were completely false, and only led the original investigation in the wrong direction. I previously made mention of a YouTube documentary about Lynette's life, and there's one point where it makes mention of the police tracking down a Native American girl who lived on the reservation and had a resemblance to Lynette. So if Lynette really did climb into Bundy's car outside her school, then I can only assume that all these eyewitnesses were mistaken, and that they actually saw this Native American girl instead. As you well know, this would definitely not be the only missing persons case in which eyewitnesses were wrong. Now, at 12 years old, Lynette was younger than Bundy's typical victim, as he generally targeted females who were in their late teens or early 20s. In fact, when Bundy was informed about Lynette's age following his confession, he acted surprised and said she looked older. We also know that Bundy's last confirmed victim, and one of the murders he was sentenced to death for, was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, whom he abducted outside her junior high school in Lake City, Florida, in February of 1978. The circumstances of that crime are very similar to how he supposedly abducted Lynette, so it wouldn't have been out of the question for Bundy to target someone that young. And of course, Bundy also claimed that his entire purpose for traveling to Pocatello was to find a female victim, but he did not have any success the previous day, as he was asked to leave the grounds of Idaho State University, and it's also been theorized that he had trouble finding victims to lure into his car because the weather at that time was unseasonably cold. As a result, Bundy was forced to spend the night at the Holiday Inn, so this might explain why he elected to drive to Alameda Junior High School the next day, which was only about two miles away. Bundy was vague about providing certain details during his confession, as he never revealed what exactly he said to Lynette in order to convince her to climb into his car. And while he said that he drowned Lynette in his hotel bathroom, he never clarified if he forcibly took Lynette into his room, or if she went in there with him voluntarily. But Bundy was known for being purposely vague in his confessions, and perhaps he was hoping his execution might be delayed, so that the authorities could learn more information about this crime. We technically do not have any hard evidence placing Bundy in Pocatello, and unless they can recover her remains from the Snake River, we may never know for certain if his story was true. But overall, I just cannot overlook the fact that Bundy revealed details about Lynette's personal life which, as far as I can tell, were not public knowledge and wound up being corroborated by her parents. So this is why I am inclined to believe that Bundy was responsible for her murder. Truthfully, if Pocatello had not experienced so many other unsolved murders in the years following Lynette's disappearance, there probably wouldn't be as much uncertainty here. We may never know the complete truth, but if Lynette's family have come to terms with the fact that she was likely a Ted Bundy victim, then they deserve to be at peace. So now I'm going to take a few moments to talk about some other female victims who went missing during the 1970s and may have been murdered by Ted Bundy. In some of these cases, Bundy made a full confession, and in others, his involvement is based on nothing more than speculation. However, what's important is that none of these victims have ever been found, so like Lynette Culver, they deserve to be memorialized, and here's a rundown of their disappearances in chronological order. On the evening of June the 29th, 1973, 17-year-old Rita Jolly left her residence in Westland, Oregon to go for a walk, but she never returned. While Bundy never confessed any involvement in Rita's disappearance, she did fit the physical profile of his typical victim, so he has been looked at as a potential suspect. On August the 20th of that year, 24-year-old Vicki Holler was last seen climbing into her car, a 1965 Volkswagen Beetle, in a parking lot in Eugene, Oregon. Vicki subsequently vanished without a trace, and as far as I can tell, her car was not located either. Investigators in Oregon wanted to question Bundy about his potential involvement in Vicky's disappearance, but never got the opportunity before his execution, so his connection to this case is unknown. On March the 12th, 1974, Donna Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, vanished without explanation, and this is one murder which Bundy did confess to prior to his death. He even claimed that after disposing of Donna's remains, they were found on Taylor Mountain one year later, but never identified. Indeed, there is some confusion surrounding this case, as some skeletal remains were actually discovered in the foothills of Mount Rainer in 1978, alongside a multicolored shirt, which matched the description of the shirt Donna had been wearing when she disappeared. However, before the remains could be tested or conclusively linked to Donna, they were inexplicably lost, so officially, she is still considered to be a missing person. Bundy also confessed to another disappearance which took place shortly after midnight on June the 11th, 1974, when 18-year-old Georgianne Hawkins, a student at the University of Washington in Seattle, went missing after leaving her boyfriend's dormitory to return to her sorority house. Bundy claimed that he approached Georgianne while walking on crutches and asked her to help him carry his briefcase to his car, but he used this ruse as an opportunity to abduct and murder her. 
While Bundy claimed that some of George Ann's skeletal remains were recovered later that year, this has never been officially verified, so her case continues to remain unsolved. On October the 2nd of that year, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox disappeared after leaving her school in Holiday, Utah to go buy a pack of gum, and witnesses would later recall seeing her riding in the passenger seat of a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. Bundy confessed to Nancy's abduction and murder, and claimed that he traveled over 200 miles to dispose of her body in Capitol Reef National Park. But oddly, even though Bundy was known for driving a Volkswagen Beetle during this time period, he denied that Nancy had ever been inside his car. Whatever the case, Nancy's remains have never been found, so Bundy's confession was not corroborated. On March the 15th, 1975, 26-year-old Julie Cunningham vanished after leaving her apartment in the skiing town of Vail, Colorado to visit a local tavern. Bundy claimed that he abducted Julie by faking an injury and luring her to his car when he asked for help carrying his ski boots. He said that he drove over 80 miles before murdering Julie and burying her body in a shallow grave in a desert near the town of Rifle, but a search of the area failed to turn up her body. Less than one month later, on April the 6th, 24-year-old Denise Oliverson left her home in Grand Junction, Colorado after an argument with her husband and was planning to ride her bike to her parents' house, but she never arrived, and her bicycle and sandals would be found under a viaduct the following day. Bundy confessed that he abducted and murdered Denise before dumping her body in the Colorado River, but even though gas receipts placed Bundy in the Grand Junction area on the day Denise went missing, she has also never been found. On June the 27th of that year, 15-year-old Susan Curtis was attending a youth conference at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, but disappeared while walking back to her dormitory. Once again, Bundy confessed to Susan's abduction and murder and claimed that he buried her body along a highway near the town of Price, but a search turned up nothing. Just one week later, on July the 4th, 23-year-old Nancy Baird went missing after abandoning her car at a gas station in East Layton, Utah. While Bundy was looked at as a possible suspect, this is one case in which he specifically denied any involvement, but since Nancy fit his typical victim profile, he has never been completely ruled out. And one more missing victim I want to mention is 8-year-old Anne-Marie Burr, who was discovered to be missing from her bedroom at her home in Tacoma, Washington on August the 31st, 1961. The reason this disappearance has been linked to Bundy is because he happened to live a few blocks away from the Burr residence at that time, and even though he was only 14 years old, there has been speculation that Anne might have been his first victim. Bundy also denied involvement in her case, but I might do a full podcast episode about this one sometime in the future. But regardless of whether or not all these missing females were victims of Ted Bundy, the message should be clear. They are the ones who deserve to be remembered, not him. So if you happen to have any information on any of the missing victims I just described, or the disappearance of Lynette Culver, or the murders of Tina Anderson, Patricia Campbell, Linda Smith, Cindy Bringhurst, and the Oneida County Jane Doe, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own thoughts about what happened, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email to robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. Now the reminder that The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so please visit patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold to learn how you can support our podcast and become eligible for some pretty neat rewards. We produced a bunch of exclusive bonus episodes for our patrons in tiers 2 and 3, and this past month, I released a fun special episode in which I counted down my top 10 personal favorite acting performances which took place in reenactments on Unsolved Mysteries. And for our patrons in Tier 3, I've also recorded another new audio commentary track, which can be played over a classic episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I'd also like to give a shout-out to our most recent listeners who have signed up with us on Patreon this week, and they are Matthew T., Kobe G., Matt Han K., and Kristen L. Thank you all so much for your support. Also, provided that it becomes safe to travel again, The Trail Went Cold is going to be appearing on Podcast Row at the very first CrimeCon UK, which is being held at the Leonardo Royal Hotel and Spa in London on the weekend of September the 25th and 26th. If you would like to purchase tickets to the event, we have a special promo code you can use to get a 10% discount. So to receive 10% off, visit crimeconco.co.uk and enter the promo code COLD21. That's COLD21. In addition, I wanted to provide another reminder that I hold live streaming sessions on a platform called Get Vocal. Every Thursday night from 7 until 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I host what is essentially an after show for each week's podcast episode, where I have an interactive discussion about the featured case from said episode and answer questions and address comments from listeners. I always include a link to these sessions in our show notes, so be sure to check there for more information or visit getvocal.com. That's G-E-T-V-O-K-L.com. I just wanted to give another shout out to my supporters at the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. I need to provide a big thanks to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. So have yourself a good week and join us next Wednesday for another brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold. Okay. Okay.